Okay, hello everybody, can you hear me? Um, okay, I'm, I'm Maya McGinnis, I run the Committee for Responsible Federal Budget, and I'm very p pleased to be moderating the panel which is going to resolve and solve all the problems that you just heard about. So, no pressure, but it looks like a very able group to do just that. Um, you have the bios of the folks who are on this panel, so let me tell you what I'm going to do. I want to just set it up where they could each kind of identify what they think the major problem that has, has been covered in the past panels or of their own, but the major problem that's facing the budget and what they would actually do to solve it. Might be something small that's sort of contained within the current budget process. It might be a big idea. We have to rip this whole process out by, by the roots and start over again. Um, and then I'm going to definitely go right to inviting all of us to participate and do a real Q&A so that we can get everybody in this room um, where there are a lot of budget experts involved in our conversation. So thanks for joining us, and I'm going to turn it over. I think, Governor, we're going to start with you and go right down the panel, if that makes sense to everybody. Well, not surprisingly, my uh, view will be state-centric. Um, uh, those of us at the state level believe that um, the states across our country are uh, important, um, equal partners in the process of providing services to uh, the American people and, and sometimes uh, feel perhaps that we're not uh, given that uh, uh, respect that the Constitution suggests in terms of that uh, federal relationship. And I guess the most important thing from a state perspective the, the federal government can do in budgeting is to uh, be more predictable and timely. Uh, states uh, have the responsibility, every state but Vermont, uh, to balance its budget. Um, some state legislatures meet only biennially. Uh, states are already beginning to prepare their fiscal 2016 uh, budgets and uh, don't even know exactly how much they're going to get for the current fiscal year. Uh, I realize there are continuing resolutions, but uh, the uncertainty is something that's very uh, disconcerting to uh, those at the state level uh, as, as we still uh, work out of the uh, Great Recession. So uh, timeliness, I think, is, uh, uh, is, is critical. Um, and secondly, um, flexibility. Now, obviously, every governor across America would like the Congress to simply write a check for X billion dollars and say, here, spend it any way you want. Um, all right, we're not going to get quite that. Um, but um, the, um, the mandates, um, even the funded kinds, aren't great, although they're better than unfunded ones. Uh, the um, um, restrictions, the maintenance of effort requirements uh, are, are not always uh, logical. And I'll give you one example. Uh, when the uh, Recovery Act passed five or six years ago, uh, one of the MOE requirements was to maintain uh, a, a, a spending level for teachers' uh, compensation. Well, in a state like Vermont and some others in, the, uh, in our part of the country, um, uh, we're losing our student age population. In Vermont, it's down one to one and a half percent per year over the last 17 years. Well, we don't need to maintain the same level of teacher compensation. Uh, we sure could have used that money for infrastructure or something else. So, um, so all of these uh, uh, specified mandates uh, just don't make sense. One size doesn't fit all in such a uh, diverse country. Um, the, the largest uh, transfer to the states, of course, is Medicaid. Transportation is second, and then it kind of drops down after that. And in the area of Medicaid, uh, states are doing a lot of different things, even pre-Affordable um, Care Act and could use more flexibility there. Now, we have the waiver process um, through HHS, through CMS, and that's helpful but onerous. And um, some of us through the uh, uh, Governor's Council, the Bipartisan Policy Center, met with our colleague Emerita, um, Secretary Sebelius, and, and I think saw some progress in terms of uh, uh, if one state has uh, uh, a waiver uh, and another state wants to do the exact same thing, it shouldn't have to go through all the hoops. It can just pick up on that, and, and there's, there's some more flexibility, more transparency there. But if a whole bunch of states are doing the same thing through a waiver, maybe it ought to be institutionalized and allowed on a, on a broader basis. Um, now, there was uh, some progress this year in, a, in an area, not a big deal, but, but uh, progress nonetheless. The Congress passed a Workforce Investment Act update. Uh, it is a new acronym that escapes me. Uh, and it consolidates a bunch of programs, uh, mostly through DOL, but uh, from some other, through some other departments as well. And it gives states a lot more flexibility in deploying those workforce training funds. A uh, small step for mankind, uh, but uh, it was a bipartisan bill. It's been signed into law. It's the kind of flexibility that we like to see in a lot of other areas around the, uh, uh, around the federal budget. And we, we actually offered something even bolder. Uh, 
um, when we talked with um, uh, some of the folks in the House and Senate working on this, we said, we got a deal for you. Um, give states, perhaps on a pilot basis, 10% less than they're getting through all the, the 47 different workforce training programs across state government now. Give them flexibility to use those dollars in a way that makes sense for that state, and we'll call it a deal. Well, they didn't put that in the bill, but, but it's, it's that kind of um, uh, flexibility that I think in the long run can, can uh, um, uh, actually uh, mean a, re a reduction in, in overall uh, spending. Um, I know uh, the phrase block grant is toxic here, I guess, in some quarters, but um, um, uh, it works in some areas. We have community development block grants. We have uh, federal housing tax credits that are essentially grants. Um, maybe we need a new name. Uh, some folks here could call them affordable care grants if they want, or others call them freedom grants. I don't care. But, uh, but more flexibility for, for the states, I think, uh, uh, makes a great deal of sense. And finally, I think it'd be good uh, uh, to engage state um, officials more than appears to be the case, at least based on what I hear from former colleagues and state budget officers. Um, through National Governors Association, through NASBO, the state budget officers, I think there's got to be a, a closer relationship, more dialogue um, between those who uh, deal with budgeting at the federal level and at the state level, because we're all in this together. It's the same people we're, we're, whom we're trying to serve, after all, and I think there's got to be a way to do it more efficiently, more uh, predictably, on a more timely basis, uh, so that we can uh, restrain spending and still provide the kind of service that the American people want and deserve. Thank you. That's great. Um, I think it's it's certain that the states are going to provide a whole lot of case studies that we can use as a reforming budget at the federal level. Um, and I am interested, you must have talked about this a lot in Vermont, being the one state that didn't have a requirement to balance your budget. Do you have thoughts on whether that is, what do you feel about that for the federal government? What did you feel about it at the state level? Well, I realize it's different, and we have um, um, debt. We have a capital budget, which the federal government doesn't. But we always say in Vermont, we don't need a requirement to balance our budget because we're just responsible enough to do it anyway. And we have uh, been... That's not what we say here. Oh, really? <laughs> That's right. You wouldn't have an organization, Maya. Right? That's right. <laughs> Um, so I, I, I think uh, uh, the feds have to do better. And I, I saw a Wall Street Journal piece that you wrote uh, recently about uh, how the deficit isn't the, uh, the major issue. It's, it's important. But in the long run, we have to, as the previous panel said, reduce that uh, debt ratio uh, so that it's, um, it's more responsible. As I tell people at home, uh, debt isn't a four-letter word. I, I mean, it's not bad uh, per se but it has to be proportional to the capacity of the entity to, to service it and, and to provide the other um, uh, services that, are, that it needs to do. So, so I think it's a matter of proportion. Um, it's a matter of uh, um, discipline. Uh, and um, um, I hope that uh, folks in this city will be able to uh, impose more than we've seen in the recent past. Super, thank you. Now, moving on, I'm hoping what we will hear about is New Zealand, which is one of the countries that does this so well in so many ways. So. You, you may answer based on anything you would like, but. Thank you, Maya. And when I was a minister, one of the things that I used to do when somebody came to me with a proposal was, I always used to say, who's done this? How did they do it? And what happened? Uh, and I think that that's useful to, to actually exercise that. So who has actually been able to balance their budget and keep them balanced for a significant period of time? Well, here's 10 countries. Uh, we looked at a period of time between 1980 and 2007 and looked for any countries that had consecutively year after year uh, been able to achieve what was, in their definition, a fiscally responsible budget. Uh, so the countries are the Netherlands, Ireland, Germany and Finland from the European Union and they set their criteria at uh, deficits at less than 3% of GDP and with debt less than 60% of GDP. But each of those four countries, once they got to that, lowered it to balanced budgets or surpluses over time. The other countries from the rest of the world are Australia, Canada, Hong Kong, New Zealand, South Korea, and Switzerland. Hong Kong's interesting because since 1948, Hong Kong has had zero debt. Uh, when on the three occasions they've had deficits, they funded their deficits out of reserves. Interesting. Uh, the next thing is what's common to all of these countries that we might learn from. 
And the most important factor in my view is that each of them has been able to establish what they consider to be fiscally responsible budget behavior. Now, if you decide and establish or identify what's fiscally responsible behavior, you've also identified what's fiscally irresponsible behavior. And as a politician, the last thing you want to be defined as is irresponsible. So having decided what's fiscally responsible behavior, uh, I think that it has a discipline on the whole process so that everybody now has to meet a certain level of criteria. Uh, I think we can learn from that. The other thing that's interesting about these 10 countries, going back to the first panel this morning, is that the culture seems to have changed because each of those 10 countries has consistently uh, kept a philosophy that says we have to have budget balance or surplus, even over the recent recession. And a number of them are going to be among the first in the world to get back to surpluses. New Zealand's back there this year, Canada either this year or next year, Ireland this year or next year. Uh, so, second thing uh, that we should note. In those countries, they have different budget rules, but they have everything on the budget. So, they have all of the debt, they have all of the liabilities, they have all of the mandatory spending. And what that really says is the decision not to do anything is, import, is as important as a decision to do something. And it should be transparent. So if you're not going to ad address problems with your mandatory or off-budget spending, it should be transparent that you decided not to do it. So I think that that's something that we could learn as well. My solution there is to say, convert the entire budget process to full accrual accounting and go to private sector generally accepted accounting standards. No way of being able to fiddle the books. Everything has to be out there and everything has to be accountable. Last point I want to make is that each of these 10 countries has parliamentary systems. And in parliamentary systems, there is a consequence for not passing a budget. The consequence is if you don't pass the budget, you have to have a new election. There needs to be a consequence for not passing a budget in the United States. Mightn't be the same, but there needs to be a significant consequence so that either Congress or the President can't get away without passing a budget. Thank you. Just get it done. That's terrific. Uh, thank you. That, that is a lot of good specific ideas. Um, Stuart. Thank you. And uh, let me just start by saying I agree with a lot with what Morris just said. Can you, can you hear me okay on this? I can hear you. Okay. I think I can borrow. Can I borrow yours? <laughs> You Is that, that's, that sounds a little bit better. Yeah, I'll borrow you some of your ideas too. Uh, I'm very interested in, uh, I guess like Morris, in looking at what are the institutional and um, issues involved in, in uh, getting where we want on the budget and the incentives and perverse incentives. So bearing that in mind, I too kind of can think of some directions that we need to consider moving in to, uh, to address the, the general problem. I think one is to think about uh, where power is within the uh, decision-making on the budget itself. Uh, we see a lot of, of activity in the US system in terms of uh, committees that can't really move uh, a, a consistent budget forward, a lot of roadblocks and so on. And so I think looking at the role of the, particularly the budget committees uh, here and elevating their status to leadership committees so that they really do have the full authority both of their individual parties and, in, and, their, and the chambers in dealing with the president, uh, negotiating and developing a budget. So I think elevating the status is very important and making the budget process a truly leadership activity from the get-go rather than uh, the leadership coming in at the last moment in order to try to kind of broker a deal. I think the second thing to look at is a whole issue of enforcement. And this gets a little bit back to what uh, Morris said about uh, um, a parliamentary system. Um, but enforcement, of course, is, 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 a, is a fundamental problem here. We, we will constantly say we're going to do things. We will put into place all kinds of requirements. We have now an IPAB in for Medicare, which is supposedly going to keep the Medicare budget on track for many years to come. I'm very suspicious that, uh, that Congress will go along with that when it comes down to it. So how would you actually uh, uh, provide for a much stronger enforcement mechanism uh, in terms of whatever agreement is made on the budget. I think one uh, possible way to look at that 
is to say, are, are there institutions uh, that could be brought more into the picture of certifying and essentially embarrassing the Congress uh, when it does not stick to, uh, to its agreements, to its budget agreements. I think there may well be a role for bringing the CBO in as well as maybe the General Accountability Office uh, and others to say there's going to be some kind of body that is going to certify whether or not the Congress has, has met its uh, targets that it set for itself in such a way that uh, sufficiently to raise public embarrassment, uh, to be noted in the press, uh, and so on. So I think it's very important to think about institutions that could play that role. I've suggested two in combination that might do that. Um, I think also, um, while, because we don't have a parliamentary system, which I can say is not my fault uh, in this uh, country, um, we don't have a parliamentary uh, system, so how would you um, get the same kind of effect that Morris said in terms of uh, a vote of confidence then triggering an election? I think pay is the way to think about this. Uh, in lots of other fields, we have the idea of warranties or paper performance. You don't get paid unless you do the job. Uh, I think, uh, and, and I know uh, Bill has tested this in, in markets around the country, that Americans uh, really do think that if Congress doesn't do its job, they shouldn't get paid. Uh, and I think there's a lot to be said for a very simple, blunt instrument of saying enforcement uh, of an agreement uh, triggers uh, not getting, or lack of enforcement triggers not actually being paid. I think that might focus the minds of individual congressmen far more than almost anything else. Um, thirdly, I think it's very important to look at uh, altering the, dif the differentiation between uh, discretionary spending and, in and entitlement spending. Uh, Meyer and I and others have, were involved in a, a little project some, some years ago where we argued that we should move away from entitlement spending um, designation in areas like Medicare, uh, Social Security, Medicaid, uh, and others, and put these programs on a long-term budget, uh, maybe a 30-year budget that is occasionally revisited every five years, but the default is to stay on that budget with the kind of enforcement that I just mentioned uh, uh, a moment ago, getting those mechanisms right. That, that alters the risk in the system the financial risk between certain groups today, particularly the elderly, who are heavily insulated from changes in the economy uh, in terms of the entitlement programs, uh, whereas the young, other groups, uh, are very vulnerable to changes. So part of the idea here is to change the basic risk by altering the entitlement mechanism and moving it much more towards a long-term discretionary uh, structure. I think if you look at other countries that have um, medium-range budgets uh, that actually look, I mean, the UK, if you look at the, how the UK National Health Service is funded, for example, it is not an entitlement program in the sense of this country. On the other hand, it's not just really um, every year uh, you start from scratch. There's, there's a, there's a medium-term budget associated, and a capital budget associated with the National Health Service, which is adjusted s slowly over time depending on economic conditions and spending levels and so on. I think we have to move very much in that direction. The last uh, uh, sort of institutional change, I, or at least issue I will raise very quickly, is the role of the CBO itself. Um, I came in just as uh, uh, Bob Reichauer said no to the, answer, to the question about whether there should be some change in that relative to OMB and so on. I sort of agree with that. But on the other hand, I think we have to revisit the effect of the CBO on the process itself. I think having, you know, point, supposedly point certain estimates of, um, of spending in multiple years has distorted the way we actually develop policy uh, in this country, um, that we need to get much more towards CBO giving a range of, of estimates and for other factors to get to be in play in terms of determining what policy is, I think. So in other words, I think the estimation role of, of, of the CBO has unfortunately distorted good policy, not through it, the fault of the CBO, but through its role in the process. And then in addition, CBO's uh, inability in some areas to actually um, make, um, have the models and capabilities to make good estimates in certain areas, say the long-term care area it would be one, has also distorted this. So I think it's very important to, re to go back and revisit 
the role of the CBO in this whole process? I'm not, let me start off by saying I'm not surprised that my friend here, and he is my friend from Shrewsbury, England, and my friend from New Zealand, would uh, support the parliamentary form of government mm -hmm. and that the concentration of the decision making in the executive versus the legislative branch. It makes it a lot different. We have a, we have a different system uh, to start off with. But having said that, I was asked uh, some ideas here. I think there are three broad areas that I would consider at the federal level that we should be focusing on. The first element is just simply very straightforward. Everything should be on budget, in the budget, across the line. Um, uh, that goes, I know the staff here understand completely, Social Security supposedly is off budget, that's a, that's a farce. Uh, Social Security should be on budget, uh, Postal Service should be on budget, and with a much trepidation in the last few years I've been getting to think about what, what, how should we handle the Federal Reserve in this action, because they have a major impact. I realize that's another difficult issue. That's my first one. I think we can come back to other issues. Second element of the budget process should be, it should be easy to understand and, and complete it on time. I, I, one of the speakers this morning referred to Jefferson, understanding simple, straightforward understanding. Quite frankly, it's a very complicated system for the average staffer up here, let alone the average member up here, to understand the process today. It, we've we made it so complicated uh, going forward. So it, and I would, and to get it done on time, and of course, then I would push that as one of the solutions, of course, biannual budgeting, which is controversial. And the third element, I think, of any budget process reform that should be considered up here should have the, and it's already been mentioned a couple of times already, active participation by the congressional leadership and uh, the president himself. I am a strong, strong supporter of something that uh, uh, Stuart just mentioned, and that is to change the makeup and go back to the way it was supposed to be, what I thought it was supposed to be, and that, that the Budget Committee is not a, in the, here in the United States Senate, it's a B committee. It should be an A committee with the leadership from the major uh, finance and, and tax writing and spending committees, appropriations on, on that committee, for the, and you get the lock-in early on in the process of the, of the leadership going forward. Um, Having said all that, we can come back to some specifics. I, I just want to put a big caveat on the table here. Um, and I apologize for not listening to some of the earlier sessions this morning. But, uh, you know, from my perspective, uh, um, reforming the budget process is not necessarily going to reprise the, uh, uh, the past or current failings of the political or legislative process up here. Uh, reforming the budget process is not necessarily going to eliminate the polarization. In fact, some could argue that it's even added to the polar polarization. It's not going to establish geniality uh, or, or restore civil discourse just by making these kinds of changes. That's something that's much more basic and much more problem, I think, in terms of the process itself. And that is simply that the, the failure to have political will. We know what we have to do. You can reform the process as much as you want, but if the political will is not there to carry forward with that and implement, well, even with the tools you have available, then I don't think just reforming the budget process is going to, going to address the concerns that we have going forward. Um, and by the way, the process is broken down in some ways, has been very bipartisan. Uh, over the last 40 years, uh, we have failed to get a concurrent resolution conference agreement nine times. Four times uh, has been when, uh, I think, when Republicans uh, controlled, uh, or, excuse me, four times when Democrats control, controlled, or excuse me, four times when re Democrats controlled, one time when Republicans, and most of the time here in the last five years. We haven't got a concurrent resolution on the budget the last five years, and that's when we've had a divided Congress. We haven't been able to get an appropriation bill passed on time for the last five years. Uh, it's, a, it's a bipartisan breakdown of the system up here, and again, that comes back to the political will. This is not your Calvin Coolidge budget also. Uh, I think he would be astonished by the level of entitlements and mandatories that were basically created after he left office. We can't go back, uh, but controlling those entitlements and mandatories are critical going forward, but you're not going to get that control unless there's back to where, I, where I'm suggesting, is you're going to have to have some agreement, some, some compromise. And the word compromise maybe is not a four-letter word. 
And it does seem to me that the biggest problem with the budget process is just that political will and the lack of desire to come to a compromise. Musical mics, okay. Um, so I was reading my memo on how to be a good moderator this morning that we all received, and it said if somebody doesn't answer your question, feel free to go back to them. And you answered my question perfectly, but I'm not sure if you answered your question about what we should do about the Fed, and that is a really interesting point. So have you figured out what you think yet? The Fed, in terms of being on budget. I, ha I haven't, I haven't. I recognize the need for the independence, but when I can see that they can maintain a $100 billion slush fund, as far as I'm concerned, that has fiscal impact, I think that should come back into consideration somehow. I don't want to take away their independence, but I'm a little nervous about uh, the way, and in fairness to the Federal Reserve, when Congress isn't doing its job, they saw a need that they had to step in. But I'm not, I don't like the idea that the Federal Reserve is setting fiscal policy, and I think that they, they kind of have leaned in that direction the last couple of years. Very interesting. Okay, Baker. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm Baker Spring, and um, I'm relatively new to this uh, issue area. Um, the story is, is that uh, until the last couple weeks, I was a fellow at the Senate Budget Committee given a research assignment to look at um, budget process reform, congressional budget process reform, essentially across the waterfront. Uh, I feel a little bit better about myself because basically all of the proposals that you've heard today um, are among the 97 that I had unearthed, setting aside ones that are redundant uh, to a large degree. For example, there's many different forms of biennial budgeting. Um, uh, but that, um, so there are many options out there for reforming the budget process. Um, and I'm just gonna focus on two of them that stood out for me in the course of my research, which uh, um, you can take uh, as you see fit. I would hasten to add, however, that um, my observations about these two issues don't represent the budget committee, members or staff or, or anybody but myself. The first one um, that came to mind to me or stood out to me in, in terms of my review was the one that was addressed to a large degree in the first panel, which is the balance of power over spending between the executive branch and the legislative branch as a result of the Impoundment Control Act um, that was included in the 1974 Act. I think, at least from my point of view, that Congress overreached in terms of how sharply or curtailed presidential impoundment authority. Um, and therefore, there's a basic constitutional balance that has been um, uh, upset as a result. Clearly, the Constitution gives Congress plenary powers to initiate spending, but from interpretations of the, of the Constitution, including by the um, early leadership immediately following the Constitutional Convention is that, uh, is that the conclusion of spending, actually moving the money out of the door, was, uh, was, was to a, a greater degree in the independent hands of the executive compared to where we are today as a result of the, uh, of the Impoundment Control Act. So I think that there's uh, a need for rebalancing. Um, I think it would have to be very carefully constructed um, uh, but I think that it, it could be there uh, nonetheless. Um, and it's more important than just the dollar levels of the monies that would be impounded by the president if such authority was reestablished. I think it would also result in, a, in, in, a, in a, at least a, a little bit of a change, a nuance change in the culture of spending. That is, is that by restoring the balance um, that uh, you could result, it, could, it could result in more fiscal discipline. The other is something that uh, I really have taken to heart um, as a result of my research, which is, is that the budget process inherently, unfortunately, inherently, is complicated, either bordering on the arcane or actually arcane. Um, I think that there is a great calling for the people that are in this room to really participate in an educational campaign on how to operate within the budget process compared to what I think is sort of the dominant culture today is how do you evade it, set it aside, um, or not pay attention to it. And what I think we need to do is focus a little bit on the interest groups that influence legislation, including that that has budgetary impact from those institutions outside of Congress itself. The interest groups, the lobbyists, 
the corporate government relations people, to train them about what the budget process really entails and how they can uh, propose to their, uh, the groups that they represent is, is that things can be done within the budget process and still have some chance of, of, of achieving the goals. There's no guarantees here and there never should be. Um, uh, but it seems to me that there's a, a, a great opportunity for um, uh, uh, educational advancement in this area. And, and what, would I, what would I look to as a marker that this was having a good impact? If you arrived at, and let's just take the lobbying community, for example, because that's probably the easiest to identify, is that the lobbyists went back to their clients and said, I'm going to propose how you can achieve whatever the goal that you have is um, within the budget process. Because I know it's going to be really hard for me to do it any other way, because Congress has finally got some discipline going about the basic integrity of the process, getting back to the regular order, that that's the least, that's the path of least resistance. Um, and if that happens and we get the people that are influencing legislation from the outside, get that cultural change where they not only recognize that they have to do it this way, but they're actually asking to be educated on how to do it. You talk to, I've talked to some lobbyists uh, since the, just in the last few weeks since I, I left my fellowship. And I said, you know, you know, there's going to be this issue about exactly what the new Republican majority in the Senate may do uh, with regard to what it wants to achieve with reconciliation bills. And they said, well, explain that to me. What does that mean? Well, you know, uh, I may have a client out there that has a proposal. And I say, well, does he understand about the bird rule? <laughs> and they sort of scratch their head. Um, so I think that it would be um, a, a moniker of improvement uh, when you see these outside participants in the legislative process start to reflect as a, uh, start to respect as opposed to evade the budget process. Oops. And, uh, and that's the benefit of having somebody new to the group because that's an idea I haven't heard discussed before. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. Um, okay, while people get ready with their questions, I'm going to throw out just three topics that I think are likely to be things that come up in the coming months. And if anybody has any thoughts on any of them, you're welcome to chime in. Otherwise, we'll go right to Q&A. Uh, but one is dynamic scoring. Two is budget baselines. There are a lot of things that are built into baselines. Uh, and number three is the long term. This is one that I think is critically important, but how do we focus our budgeting to take the long term into account? So if there are thoughts on any of those three, I do think that they will be uh, front and center in the coming months. Please jump in. Otherwise, people can, can ask their questions. You have to change your microphone every time you speak. Right. Can I just answer the last one first? Because when we look at the countries around the world in terms of the long term, what they're doing is that they're coming to a consensus inside their own nation about what constitutes a fiscally responsible position for the country. For example, in my country, New Zealand, the government's most recent budget sets that out as being budget surpluses and debt below 10% of GDP. Uh, others have set that at, as, as the Canadians have, uh, debt under 30% of GDP somewhere about 2025. Uh, so they're using that as a long-term uh, mechanism to say this is where we need to be and we're resilient to shocks. Uh, so it's not a sort of an arbitrary figure that says um, our deficit must never be more than this. They're looking at the total position debt uh, and deficits and what resilience they have to shocks that might come along. I mean, I'll just add to that that I think uh, this whole this is a very important issue. Uh, obviously, in terms of if you think about uh, people's expectations, uh, individual people's expectations of what services are going to be available to them as they age and if they get sick and so on. So it's critical to get that right. And I think if you look at other countries and and what. Um, the, that I was getting at, I think, in, in our earlier proposal, Maya, was to say, you know, there's got to be more of a, of, a, of a decision about what the purpose and what the scale of a program should be over time. So when we think about a long-term budget, we're not, we're not necessarily thinking only about trying to forecast. Part of this gets all wound up in forecasting when you say, well, how could you possibly have a budget in Medicare over 30 years? Uh, you can't possibly know um, what, what the health costs are going to be. That's correct. Um, but there are other objectives that one has in mind, such as you know, keeping certain spending in that area um, uh, in, in proportion to what you're spending on education for kids and so on. A country can make those broad decisions. Uh, 
And I think we need to move to a long-term, a view of long-term budgeting, saying let's decide as a country kind of what our long-term objectives are and what are the principles behind them. Make that the basis of the budget. Have that the default that can be changed, but, but it becomes the default uh, for, for budget over time. I think that's, that's the way to think about this issue. Um, and I don't think we've kind of really kind of looked at it in quite that way. Can I, uh, first of all, correct the record? I, I muffed the, uh, there's nine times that we haven't got a concurrent conference agreement on a budget resolution over the last 40 years. Three times that was when Republicans controlled both the House and the Senate, one time when the Democrats controlled both the House and the Senate, and the other five times is when there was a divided Congress, and that's been over the last five years. I want to tie I want to tie dynamic scoring and long-term together. Uh, uh, with hesitation, I say this. I believe changes in the tax code, marginal tax rates does have, sorry, you're in the light, <laughs> uh, does have a behavioral effect and can influence tax revenues. I'm not, I don't think anybody, necessarily, it, it's at the margin. My problem is that while I, while I believe in dynamic scoring on the tax side, I want to be very careful in the long term. I could make the case, maybe I could argue the case. I know people will argue the case. Well, if we invested more in education or infrastructure or health care research, that there would be long term dynamic effects on the spending side also. So while I think there is dynamics of uh, budgetary effects from both taxes and spending, I think you risk yourself, uh, there's a big risk of going down a very slippery slope from a budget perspective, then all we have to do is cut taxes and increase spending and the long term will be better off. I don't think that's a wise approach and therefore I come back to what we have today, look at a total budget. I believe CBO directors that are here will remind us that they do dynamic scoring when they have a total package. But you can't take a piece, one piece of legislation and score that, not looking at it in, in the context of a total package. I guess I feel I can criticize politicians since I was one for 35 years. Um, folks in the Congress have to understand that some decisions they make won't bear fruit f for a long time. Um, in our little state, we launched a delivery system reform program for health care 11 years ago, and now, uh, after all that time, um, we're seeing a, a decline in the per patient expenditures. We're seeing a decline in certain communities. and terms of uh, ER visits and, uh, and uh, hospitalizations, um, but it wasn't immediate. And we have two-year terms, so it's like five or six terms later. And we have to have folks with that longer-term perspective here. Um, uh, Bill hit uh, the nail on the head in, in several of his earlier comments. One is that uh, Coolidge would be appalled today. He vetoed a, a veterans benefit bill uh, not too long after World War I, everybody told him it would be political suicide, but even then he didn't want entitlements to grow uh, unsustainably. And, of course, he was elected uh, overwhelmingly in 1924. And when I first uh, gave a budget to our legislature, I quoted President Kennedy, who said, to, to govern is to choose. And we need folks who will make those tough decisions, uh, not satisfying every interest group, um, it means they won't get invited to some dinner where they get an award for being Senator of the Year by such and such an organization. <laughs> but that's what we need, people to, to make those tough decisions that are in the long-term best interests of the American people. And um, um, perhaps we'll, we'll get to that point. Thank you. Okay, I'm officially blind, so as I open up the, uh, the floor to questions and answers, I can't see any of you anymore. So, wait, I see. <laughs> Okay. Uh, so you can't hear me and I can't see you. But if there are any questions down there, we'd love to invite you. And we will find you. I 
Is there one in the back of the room? Hi, Greg McNeil, uh, Senate Budget Committee. Um, you know, it, it strikes me you look at almost any rudimentary textbook of government budgeting, uh, and you see a, a four-phase budget cycle of uh, assembly, adoption, execution, and evaluation. I'm sure some of you guys have written those textbooks and included those. Um, and you look at most governments and you see those four things, but you look at the federal government and you really don't see that fourth phase of evaluation. You see the, the assembly and the, the, we obviously sometimes, uh, as Bill points out, sometimes we do through the adoption phase, but um, we really don't go back and look at how the things we've spent our money on actually did. Um, and so I'm wondering uh, if that's uh, really one of the missing pieces of the budget process is that we never really go back and look at, you know, is, I mean, several of you, several of persons in the panels, the various panels have talked about our long-term entitlement programs, but when was the last time we actually reviewed how one of these programs are doing? Um, you know, half of our non-defense discretionary spending is, uh, you know, expired authorizations, but we still keep funding it. So I'm wondering if you, if you guys could comment on how maybe a look back process might help uh, enable a better budgeting process. Good, I open that up to the panel. Thank you. A number of countries are actually, I would say, experimenting with exactly what you're talking about. Some of them are calling it budgeting to outcomes, but there's a real attempt to try and link the expenditure to what public benefit arose from that expenditure. Uh, the Brits had something that went through their treasury which was called a value for money equation. Uh, the government of New Zealand has purchase contracts with its um, departments, the heads of the department, and they hold their job based upon whether they can deliver that purchase contract. Uh, Australia has um, honesty in budgeting and they purchase outcomes. Uh, so there's a lot of that going on and I think that a lot can be learnt from it. The absence of an indication of the result really just means it's like giving pocket money to your kids, hoping they're going to save it, but knowing that they're going to blow it all on stuff that's not going to have much value. And frankly, you can't act in a responsible manner while that happens. Can I just correct something? Uh, I don't favor parliamentary systems over the republic kind of system that you have in the United States. I got to tell you that governments or countries with parliamentary systems have managed to screw up their economy much more frequently than you ever have. It's just that it's easier to screw it up and it's easier to fix it. So it takes you longer to do it, um, but longer to fix it. So not advocating any change, just get people who make harder decisions. It's a very good question, and I think it goes back to what I was trying to get at in terms of the broader problems you have, and that is that uh, there is something called the authorizing process, the authorizing committees, the oversight, the review, and that process has been weakened by the time that's been spent just getting the appropriation, and quite frankly, something even broader, the time that most members spend raising money to, for their campaigns as opposed to actually legislating and governing up here. And so that's why I'm a, one of those elements that and most people probably know in the room that I support, I came to it gradually, is uh, biannual budgeting and appropriating to give an opportunity maybe for the authorizers to do the job. We also have a course on the books, something called GIPRA, which was supposed to uh, do exactly what you said, and uh, my recollection is that created more paperwork and got uh, became uh, thrown into the circular files when those reports came up here, as opposed to the authorizing committees doing the job that they should have been, which was oversight. Um, I just add that that uh, perhaps this is in the category of hope springs eternal, but I actually think that the that the executive branch bureaucracy can be helpful in this regard. If you if you give them enough protection to identify in whatever appropriate forum um, the programs that they really don't think are working um, uh, and that they don't like because they're difficult to manage or because uh, uh, they're there only because they perceive it as a special interest that's that that push them into the budget and so forth and so on. And you could, you could perhaps use the bureaucracy um, to a greater degree than we have in the past in terms of really performing effective evaluations of programs. Not in all cases, but I think in some. 
Um, one, which is there in some areas of the government, there is a lot of data that is collected, and what it isn't is integrated into the budget process. So I think the point about needing to do more on entitlements just to evaluate how effective they are is really important. But in the areas where we are collecting data, the challenge is how you work into the overall process. And the other piece I would, I would add is tax expenditures. Whole piece of the budget, trillion dollars every year, very little evaluation goes on there. I think as we're talking about tax extenders in the next month, one of the things we're seeing is more consideration about what's really working and what's not. But bringing tax extenders into the area where evaluation should take place is something I would add as well. Is there another question from the audience? Yes, Bill. Uh, my, uh, Bill Beach with the Senate Budget Committee. Uh, my question is, should it, is it time for us to open up the 1974 Act and put inside of it a regulatory budget? Uh, we are at, uh, some people estimate $1.3 trillion in, in burden, much of it justified, but it's probably some of it not. Should we be budgeting the large regulations, the six or seven each year that come out of the administration? You yeah. say yes together, right? Yes. <laughs> I think Chris, had, uh, you had written a piece on this, and, and I agree completely. I think, you, I think there ought to be a way in which when those regulations are issued, when there is a requirement that there be a cost estimate made in the OMB, when it exceeds a certain level, that should be automatically be sent to Congress, and they should have a fast-track authority to overview the, review those regulations. Yes, it should be part of the budget process. Um, my view of a budget is that it's a strategic document and it should be the government's plan of what they're going to do for society and it should certainly incorporate into it considerations about what this budget is going to do to competitiveness and what this budget is going to do to growth in the economy and for those reasons you should certainly include in it the impact of regulations. Uh, can I just make another comment that looking at this research from different places around the world, uh, something that's followed in many places, and that is that they have a Supreme Budget Committee, different names, but after the appropriators have finished their work, the decisions of the appropriators come back to this Budget Committee, and their job is to make certain that that budget is still in line with the original concept of what would be a responsible budget. So they have the ability to be able to veto the decisions of the appropriators to see that they get the outcome that they want. Now, I know Bill's been playing around with this idea, but make the chairman of each of the appropriation committees a member of that committee and make them go through each other's decisions and say, hey, this is really low value, we should cut that out, we should veto that, we should veto that. With nobody being responsible for the total outcome, you're not going to get a good decision. We did have something called a second budget resolution that was designed to do that, and we dropped it. Um, just getting back on the question about a regulatory budget, um, uh, I think that, that I'm a yes, too. I, I think that that should be done. Uh, I did not go there in terms of the research that I did because I thought that the, the relationship between the executive branch and the Congress in that area had to be different, um, and so I decided to narrow myself to the question of the, of the fiscal elements of the, uh, of the overall budget picture. So I think that, that that represents a different set of solutions, one suggested here. Um, but I think that gives a flavor for why they would be different. One idea that I've heard before that I've always thought was interesting, I think Senator Warner has talked about this, but is a pay-go for regulations. Um, and my recollection is that they might do it in Britain um, I don't know, but if, if they do it elsewhere, then that would also be one of those opportunities where we could say who else does it and how has it worked. But sort of the notion of these are not free costs and let's start tracking them and let's start at least limiting them by not adding new ones without taking out old ones. Because regulations are just like the budget in that once something's entrenched, it has a life that is basically endless. And so some kind of pressure to create trade-offs where you decide if there's something new you want to, which there always will be, um, what is it that you want it to replace? So I'm, I'm intrigued with that idea. It makes a lot of sense. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. 
I'm Joseph McCormick. I'm a graduate student at GW getting my degree in economics, specifically working with balanced budget requirements. So my question's for Governor Douglas. Um, with Vermont, you talked about how you don't have a balanced budget requirement, but specifically the timing is what you mentioned that really helped you to develop the budget for the state. Is there something specific about how your budget cycle is done that you've seen work better than other states and how you would incorporate it? Not really. Um, uh, the Vermont Constitution is the shortest of the 50, I should add. We're laconic, like Coolidge, um, and has been amended uh, the least. So uh, where other states have put balanced budget uh, requirements in over time, we, our Constitution hasn't changed a whole lot since 1793. Um, but I, I think uh, because our legislature meets every year, it's not as problematic, problematic as it is in those states where it's biennial. And uh, that's where the timeliness of uh, congressional action is so troublesome. Um, so I, I think we uh, do okay, but, uh, but uh, more uh, predictable information from, uh, from Washington will help every state. Okay, um, what I'm gonna do is point out that they have indeed solved the problem. Um, and I'm just gonna, I was just looking at all the things, um, I rarely can read my own handwriting, but I think that what we have come up with here is that in order to improve the budget process, the budget needs to be more timely, that it needs to be more flexible, we need to have um, a culture where we know what works and we emphasize that. The norm, it's just norms, it needs to be, people need to be more responsible, the budget needs to be more transparent. While we don't have to adopt a parliamentary system, we need more accountability and more consequences. Uh, budget committees should become leadership committees. Institutions should play a greater role in enforcement. Uh, if they do not pass a budget, there should be consequences, perhaps not paying them. There should be more budgeting for entitlements. CBO should offer a range rather than just point estimates. Everything should be on the budget. The Fed, we still have to figure out. That will be another panel. Uh, we need to simplify the process. There needs to be political will. We have to control entitlements. We need to rebalance the power between the executive and Congress, and there needs to be a process where outside groups feel like the budget process is the way to get things done, and they become educated on it, and a few others along the way. So hopefully I have not missed any of the main ones. I thought it was a terrific panel. Um, thank you very much, and I believe we're gonna, you're going to tell us what to do next. Well, how about Thanks, a, everybody. How about a big hand for the panel, especially for Maya, battling the sun, battling the microphones, and still capturing all those wonderful reform proposals.